I had met Nat Sweeney, I think, briefly sometime around this time, 96 or 97, maybe 98. But then when I finished making I See a Darkness and we had this, you know, effectively a brand new record label and I needed to figure out what to do with it. And so I went to New York City for an extended stay, figuring that putting myself bodily in such a place would be helpful if we were starting from scratch and letting the world know that this record exists. So I went to New York City instead of being in Shelbyville, Kentucky, where nobody would, you know, encounter this stuff. And I I started working with a publicist at a publicity firm called uh, Nasty Little Man. And at the time, Sweeney was sort of an honorary staff member there because he's got an astounding way of just, he's a publicist. He's kind of a publicist. He, he loves the things he loves and he loves to turn other people on to the things that he loves. It's his passion. And, and we had a mutual friend who was in distress. And so I ran into him one day on the way to nest little man. We started talking, we talked, 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 became close friends and started hanging out all the time. And uh, at one point he, a year or two later, probably two years later, he called and said that he had just run into somebody, Neil Strauss, I think, the kind of bizarre music into sex writing person <laughs> out there, uh, who, I'll, who I'll be eternally grateful to forever. But he said that he'd run into Neil Strauss, I think, who'd said that he'd just played a bunch of Bonnie Prince Billy records or, some, or, or he played I See a Darkness, maybe some other things for Rick Rubin, something like that. And then Sweeney, he saw Rick Rubin on the street, introduced himself, and mentioned that we were friends and Rick Rubin said, oh, well, Johnny Cash is just, we've just cut a demo of I See a Darkness. And Sweeney called me to tell me that. And that was, you know, right there, even if it wasn't true, that was, you know, one of the most, felt like an achievement. You know, it was one of the most exciting things I'd ever heard in my entire life. And that's it. You know, this demo, I know, never count one's chickens before they hatch. And so I, you know, I just thought, well, that's really neat. That's one of the, thank you so much for sharing that. And then we did a show at the Bowery Ballroom in New York, me and Sweeney, probably Mike Fellows, maybe James Lowe playing drums. And Rick Rubin came to the show and said, yeah, we have cut that song. And, you know, what would you think about maybe coming out, coming to a session and overdubbing some piano on it? I said, of course, I'd love to do that. Absolutely. Uh, He said, okay, great. Here's my phone number. And I, you know, didn't know what to do exactly. So I called him the next day. He didn't answer. I left a message and I said, Mr. Rubin, uh, this is Will Oldham. I just, I have to tell you, I I, actually, I I can't play piano. And uh, I didn't play it on the record. Colin Gagan did. and, And I don't necessarily expect anything to come of this whatsoever. However, if there were any way out of this brief you know, window, you thought there might be an appropriate time for me to potentially meet Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash. And that would mean the world to me because they were big in my world, in my brain, you know, like both of them together, especially because I love, you know, I love the energy of people together and I love Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash's energy together. It's like, it was like Neil Haggerty and Jennifer Harrimer or something like that. So he called back and said, okay, okay, well, we're doing a session in a a few weeks at my house in Los Angeles, if you'd like to come to that, you know. So I booked a flight out there using Southwest points to Los Angeles. It was a Sunday. I, I arrived in the morning. I rented a car and I had no plan except just to call Rick Rubin and go over to his studio. And I landed and I'm, you know, pulling over every two or three miles from the airport into the city, going to a phone booth and calling the number and nobody's answering. And I'm thinking, boy, you know, there's egg on my face. What a, what a rube move to like fly out to California because some guy said I can come to this recording session. But then at around two in the afternoon, a woman answered and she, I said, my name's Will. Um, Rick invited me out to this session. She said, oh, he's just waking up now. Yeah, you can come on over. Come on over. Gave me the address off the Sunset Strip. Went there. Ruben was coming down. I could hear Johnny Cash's voice on a loudspeaker from the studio in the depths of the of the house. 
And so Cash comes out, Ruben comes out, Ruben introduces me. You know, I said something like, hello, Mr. Cash. He said, please don't call me Mr. Cash. You can call me John, JR, or Johnny, but don't call me Mr. Cash. And Ruben said, this is Will Oldham. He wrote that song, I See a Darkness. And Cash said, uh, well, then why don't we work on that song right now? Which I was not, you know, of course, was not expecting. And we went in and immediately started working on it. And and, uh, they played it for me then. And I didn't hear anything wrong with it. (laughs) I could, you know, to me, it sounded like the coolest thing I could ever have imagined in my wildest dreams. Uh, It was him and then somebody playing acoustic guitar. I said, who's playing guitar? They said, might be Randy Scruggs. I'm not sure. So I'm not even sure that they knew at the time who was playing guitar, but Cash was singing on it. It sounded fantastic. But Cash said he wasn't happy with his delivery. Would I help out? And ultimately, I I tracked a whole guide vocal, and they put our voices together and found that the voices sounded good together. And then Cash tried to sing along to my guide vocal. That didn't work, which is good, because that's a stupid idea. So then the next idea was for me to go and sit in the vocal booth with him, just sitting knee to knee, you know, with our faces about two and a half feet from each other, with him on the mic, turning to me each time it was time to begin a line to wait for my signal for him to begin the line. Which is, you know, one of the most exciting challenges I've ever been given because it took so much presence of mind to just not disintegrate into nothingness at the surreality of the experience. But I'm a musical entity in many ways. You know, it, it's what I, I'm a human being as well who has other interests, I guess, but I look at the world through music and how it's created and, and what it does and what it's intended to do. And that's something that, in part at least, I believe that I share with Johnny Cash. And so in that moment, it was just this thing where I thought, you know, this is one of those weird things, weird times where everybody may have some degree of an imposter syndrome. At that moment, I did not have an imposter syndrome. I felt like, oh, this is one of the few things that I actually feel like I can do is to guide this music person through the performance of this song. And so let's just do this. But that's all happening in fragments of seconds because we're doing it. And then it worked. You know, we did one take with me sitting there with him and it's awesome. Uh, And then I think June Carter Cash came in and sat on the couch with me and you know talked to me about the first time they heard the song. She said it was on a tape, a cassette that Rick had sent them in Jamaica where, where they had a house. And she said that after they heard the song, she claims that she turned to her husband and said, John, you have got to record that song. <laughs> 